Anything happening? Does it go three, two, Live. One? And we're live. All right. Wait hey, everybody. Wednesday. Sorry we're a little bit late logging on. If you can hear me, please type in that you can hear me. We've never had a problem with people not being able to see. Every now and then they're not able to hear. So, Charles, do you see anybody? Let's see. We have one viewer. Only so, one viewer. Oh, no, yeah. now we're up to four. But I need one but, of those viewers to please say, I can hear you. I so, hope someone can hear us. Let's see, Colleen Dunbar says hello. Okay. Jennifer Dyson's there. Hey, Jen, it was so great seeing you at the conference. Thank you for Jan all your help. Jen says I can hear you. Thank you so much, Jennifer Dyson. She wasn't even a real volunteer. I mean, she was, but she wasn't designated, and she just stepped Cindy in. Cindy can hear us. Helped us Colleen so much, and she gave me homemade sun-dried tomato powder. So great that you guys can hear. Well, let's get started. Thank you to my husband, Charles, for doing this today, giving Kenny and Eden the day off. They both were volunteers at our live Ultimate Weight Loss Conference, which we just got back Donna from Weaver Vegas. Donna can hear us. Good. We're tired, Jessica though, aren't we? Jessica can hear us. Okay. Val can hear us. You don't have to read everybody that can hear us. I think, the, I think the bottom line is they can hear us, so we'll get started. Kenny and Eden, if you're watching, thanks for your help volunteering, and also thank you to Jackie Shook, and who else volunteered? We have quite a few people. Stacy Itama, Shada Soleimani, Vanessa Gilbert, Sharon McRae, so hopefully I didn't forget anyone. It was a great conference, and if you were there, thank you so much for coming. I'm getting a lot of nice feedback from people in the group that said I'm not that big of a bitch after all. They said that I'm actually quite nice, so thank you. Well, I hope everyone can see us. Someone says is it audio only. No, so. it's audio and visual. And by the way, the word bitch, B-I-T-C-H, it means babe is taking care of herself. And Dr. Lyle liked that acronym. So let's get started. Hey everybody, I'm Chef AJ, and welcome to episode 44 of Weight Loss Wednesday. That means there's 43 other episodes that you can watch. This is where I answer your questions about healthy, permanent, and sustainable weight loss. I'm the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, and if you'd like to submit a question, please go to our website, www.eatunprocessed.com, and while you're there, why not sign up to be on our mailing list? So we have a few questions left over for next week, unless, Charles, you see a question right now that I could answer. Uh, no Not questions yet. yet. All right, great. Well, these are from last week, and we're sorry we didn't get to them, but we always do save them. So Katie wants to know, for someone who usually has peanut butter and toast or oatmeal for breakfast, what are some plant foods that you would recommend a person new to eating veggie for breakfast try for success? So... Katie, if you're in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, we have a 21-day recipe guide, and if you're not in, please consider joining. So it really depends on where you are personally, Katie, with your vegetable eating, because some people come to the program absolutely detesting vegetables, and our next question from Deborah is exactly one of these individuals. And so I would like to know how many vegetables are you eating right now, which ones you like, and how you like to prepare them. And then I would say to you, why not do that? You know, people think it's so weird to eat vegetables for breakfast, even though almost every country in the world, at least all the ones I visited, eats vegetables as part of breakfast. In Japan, as I mentioned many times, when I went there to work as an actress in 1992, I was in a regular hotel. They didn't care or know that I was vegan, but every day I was served miso soup with vegetables, salad, and rice for breakfast. So if you hate all vegetables, I always recommend that you eat the one that you hate the least. And as you continue to eat it, and as you see what it does to stabilize your brain chemistry, to fight cravings for unhealthy foods like the sofas that we try to avoid, sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, and salt, and to give you the health and the body you deserve, you actually learn to love vegetables because we actually develop taste preferences for what we habitually eat. And the reason that most people don't like vegetables is because they just don't eat them habitually. And as a matter of fact, there's only one taste preference inherent in human beings, and that's breast milk. And if you keep eating them, you'll learn to love them. It takes about 15 times to try a new food for it to become a preferred food. And any of you with children know that the first time you offer your kids something, if they turn the head, you don't just say forget it. You keep offering, you keep trying. And so if you're new to eating vegetables for breakfast, Try the one you love the most or the one you hate the least. We have plenty of recipes in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program in our private group page in the files. My favorite for people that really hate vegetables are the balsamic Dijon glazed vegetables. You can get that at episode 107 at Healthy Living with Chef AJ on Foodie TV. It's online free if you don't want to join the program. The oven, rata, oven roast ratatouille episode 110 is another great one for breakfast. I just eat steamed zucchini now because it's easy and it's fast. My husband Charles eats something called cruciferous crunch that he makes in the Instant Pot. But even if you're not willing to eat vegetables, what I would say is start your day in a savory way, especially if you're overweight and a food addict, especially if you're a sugar addict. Eating peanut butter and toast, and 
you know, I don't know, Katie, if you're overweight or if you're just somebody that maybe wants to get healthier, because if, if you are overweight, then peanut butter and toast is one of the absolute worst things you can eat, because think about it just in terms of caloric density, peanut butter is 3,000 calories a pound, and bread is 1,500 calories a pound, and fat with carbs together is what make people fat. See, carbs don't really make you, well, carbs don't make you fat if they're whole food, unrefined carbs, like potato, rice, and beans, or fruits and vegetables, but when you combine carbs with fat, that's a disaster. Think of it like French fries, you know, oil, with the fried sugar, oil, and salt, or cheese on top of the potato, things like that. It's the fat with the carbs that make people fat. And that's why if somebody is insistent on eating added fat, which you absolutely can do if, if you're healthy, happy with the weight you have eating a certain level of fat, all the doctors in the plant-based movement recommend if you're going to eat fat, and that would be whole food fat, like avocados, nuts, and seeds, not oils, that you eat them with greens and that you wait about four hours before you actually eat carbs. So peanut butter and toast, while delicious, don't get me wrong, I mean, I, there's nothing more delicious than, you know, hot, crispy toast with a smear of peanut butter on it. It really is a disaster if you're trying to lose weight. And of course, any flour products, if you're suffering from food addiction, are a complete disaster for your brain chemistry, because as we know, sugar and flour go through the same refining process as drugs and alcohol. You know, we, we talked about this in, in our private group today about oatmeal. When somebody is a food addict and a sugar addict and they're now getting rid of sugar and flour and breads and things like that, oatmeal be, becomes their, like, their, their new addiction. And we have so many people that just can't not eat oatmeal. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with oatmeal, especially if you make savory oats with greens and shiitake mushrooms and things like that or if you eat the whole oat groat, but what most people that are eating oatmeal for breakfast for, they're eating the third incarnation. They're not eating the whole oat groat, and they might not even be eating the steel cut oat. They're eating the third incarnation, which is steamed and flattened, and it's very, very processed, so it raises your glycemic index. I mean, it doesn't raise your glycemic index, it raises your, um, your blood sugar more quickly, which raises your insulin more quickly. It's much higher in the glycemic index and much absorbed much more quickly than the whole oat groat. So if somebody is insistent on eating oats for breakfast, I recommend and the oat groat, and I don't recommend you eat it with fruit because what happens is the oats become the flour or the bread and the fruit becomes the sugar, so it's like you're eating cake for breakfast. Delay that activation of the sweet taste, even with fruit, for as late in the day as possible. And right now it's very hot everywhere I've been, Sacramento, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, it's been over 100. Having a salad is great for breakfast, or even having a soup, like a gazpacho soup. So that's what I would recommend, is to eat the vegetable you love the most, and if you hate them all, the one you hate the least. Thanks for the question, Katie. Anything, Charles, Yeah, a couple, of, couple of questions. Angela wants to know where she can buy that shirt that you're Yeah, wearing. Angela, thank you. I, I usually mention my shirts. This is from Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, PCRM.org. I actually love this shirt. I got it at their International Conference for Nutrition and Medicine in, I believe it was July when I spoke there. It might have been a special just for the conference, but I'm pretty sure if they don't sell it now at www.pcrm.org, they will. But thank you, I love the color and I love the, the sleeves. So that's where I got it at PCRM. Another question was, uh, is homemade vegetable soup a good option for breakfast? Sure, it's That's a great, it's like a, Debbie. Debbie, it's That's a great that. option, and like I said, in, in, in the Asian countries, soup is breakfast, miso soup in particular. It's a great option, and what's so great about it is that especially if you have a high-powered blender like a Blendtec or a Vitamix, you can make hot soup in three minutes, and I think it's great if you blend some of them and maybe leave some of them whole, you know, so that you're actually chewing. It's way different than, than, than a smoothie, and I think it's terrific. You know, soup What's interesting, Debbie, is that water in and of itself does not lead to satiation because it exits the digestive tract too quickly. But when it's combined in the whole food, we know that water and fiber together make bulk, and bulk is what creates satiety. It also adds weight to the food, and that helps you feel full. So soup is fantastic at every meal, before every meal, if, even if you're not doing the program full on, starting every meal with a low calorie, low fat vegetable soup or a salad is going to dilute the calorie density of the entire meal. So it is terrific. Yes, soup is great for breakfast. And we have a lot of people that are, believe it or not, we have three truck drivers in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. And we have people that, that, that have jobs where they can't always get to food so easily. And having a hot blended soup or a hot soup with some chunks in it, you can put in a, a thermos. It can stay hot all day and you can get to it when you get to it. So it's terrific. Anything else, Charles, before I Let's go? Let's see. No other questions right now. All right. So Deborah says that sometimes I gag in the morning eating my steamed veggies. Any suggestions on what I can do with them to make them taste better? I tried Heather's cheese sauce, but that didn't cut it. 
So Deborah, believe it or not, I hear this question more often than I would like, and sometimes I hear from people that even the thought of eating vegetables for breakfast make them gag. And what I've noticed is, and I'm not saying this is you, but the people I've worked with personally, is the worse your diet is, and the longer it's been bad, and often also the more heavy a person is, the more resistant they are to this idea for vegetables for breakfast. And I've talked about this in many episodes that the reason we've been doing this since January 12, 2012, and my thin husband does it too, is because the medical research shows that there are compounds in vegetables, especially the greens, the dark green leafies, that actually turn off the hunger switch and fight cravings for unhealthy foods like sugars and flowers. And they're also the most nutrient dense foods you can eat that most people aren't eating a significant amount from and they're also the most calorically dilute, so it's a win-win-win. And I find that the people that don't even try the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, by the way, we offer 30-day money-back guarantee, no questions asked. So the people that don't even try it are generally the ones that have to eat the oatmeal and fruit for breakfast and won't even try eating vegetables for breakfast because they say that it either makes them gag or that the thought of it makes them gag. Now, one thing, if it, you know, if... If it only makes you gag the thought of it for breakfast and not at other times, then I'm wondering if that's possibly somewhat in the psychological realm. Because the truth is, is if you're not hungry enough to eat vegetables, you really aren't hungry. And you've probably never really been hungry. And the way you know if you're hungry is you go to a place like the True North Health Center and you go on a medically supervised therapeutic water only fast. And when you break that fast, the first, food, the first solid food you get, other than the juice, is steamed zucchini. And I've worked there now on and off, you know, for the, for special events, and I go there a couple times a year to speak for about seven years, and every time somebody gets their steamed zucchini, the first food they eat, whether it's a three-day fast, one week, 10-day, two week, or up to 40 days, it's like they have an orgasm, a foodgasm when they eat that. And so one of the things I suggest, I suggest this whether you're eating vegetables for breakfast or oatmeal, is you wait until you're hungry to eat. But the thing is, is Oatmeal and fruit will always be appealing to everyone. I make oatmeal and fruit every day for Charles as his second breakfast, and I smell it, and I, I mean, it looks delicious. It looks like dessert, tastes like dessert. But if you're not hungry enough to eat vegetables, you're probably not hungry, because the truth is, is any nutrient, any food with actual nutrient value, value will satisfy your hunger. But if you need specific foods to satisfy your hunger, that's not hunger, that's craving, that's food addiction, that's emotional eating. And you can kind of tell what it is by what you're choosing to eat. And so what you can do to make vegetables taste better is to neuroadapt. And by that, I mean you need at least 30 days on this program without sofas, sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, salt, for this food to start tasting good, especially if it's the salt that you're missing. Now we offer things like Benson's Table Tasty and cooking techniques to make things you know, to add flavor to them. But the truth is, is when you, when you neuroadapt, whole natural food, even unadorned, even steamed zucchini, will taste good. So to make them taste better, I gave suggestions with the last question that Katie asked about the oven roasted ratatouille, the balsamic Dijon glazed Brussels sprouts. But until you neuroadapt, nothing's gonna taste good, or it's not gonna taste as good as it, as it can. And the thing is, is it can take 30 days following a no added salt diet for, for things to taste good in that realm, for things to start to taste salty, like a piece of celery or a piece of chard. And as far as fat is concerned, you know, that's the other thing about oats. Oats are almost 20% fat. They're the, the grain that is probably highest in fat, which is probably so many, why so many people in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program that are food addicts like it, because we are a low fat diet. We're actually a no added fat diet. When you first join, we recommend that for the first 21 days, you don't add any olives or coconut or nuts or seeds especially if you're trying to lose weight because we want you to have a chance to know adapt because it takes it takes a while for for that fat receptor to down regulate dr esselson says and you have to often go as low as 11 percent of calories from fat which is what you'll get if you just don't add any fat so to make vegetables taste better you need you need time you need, and you need practice you need to eat them so you find ways that you enjoy eating them and you wait until you're hungry to eat them and you don't eat the other stuff too because they're listen if you're still dipping into the right of the red line and if you're still eating chocolate and high fat plant foods and you know and flour and sugar and drinking alcohol or drinking things like diet soda it, it, you know it, they're just not going to taste good it takes time if you want it to go faster this process of neurological adaptation and have your sensitivity or taste buds restored 
then you then fasting will make it go better. Like Dr. Goldhammer jokes that at True North, we make good food taste not bad. So again, if, if you didn't like that cheese sauce, maybe you like another cheese sauce, but I've not met anybody yet. And I, as a matter of fact, I'm teaching at Rancho La Puerta hands-on cooking in a couple weeks. I'll be there September 16th through 23rd if you'd like to come. And we make these recipes there. Now these are people that are not overweight, they're not food addicts, and they love the oven roasted ratatouille. They love the balsamic Dijon, balsamic Dijon glazed Brussels sprouts. We do it over white turnips there and broccoli and cauliflower. They love the zoodles. By the way, that's a great breakfast. Uh, the zoodles, the, the zucchini noodles that you spiralize with my quick sun-dried uh, marinara sauce and with my enlightened faux parmesan and then add the oven roasted ratatouille so you know the thing is is uh, if, if, if you won't like it until you do it and the other thing is is there actually is hypnosis to help you really love vegetables uh, we have two friends Dale and Lisa Lisa Hubler and Dale Jaffe and they are vegan hypnotherapists in Toluca Lake and they could at I don't know where you live but you might be able to find somebody in your neighborhood they can actually help you with this through hypnosis. So thanks for the question, Deborah. Anything, Charles, before oh, I go to the next one? Oh yes, we have questions. Um, Kelly asks, is it okay to use aminos to spice up soups? Okay, so when you say okay, it depends. If you're in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, I don't recommend using any salt products. Even though it is the lowest amount of sodium than anything, I'm, if somebody is insistent on using it, I would recommend that over Bragg's or Tamari because it has only 95 milligrams for sodium per teaspoon as opposed to 2300 for salt and much higher for Bragg's and, and low sodium tamari. But if you are trying to neuroadapt, which is what I just talked about, keeping that in is not gonna help. And we discussed, I believe it was last week, how eating salt, even in small amounts, causes you, especially as a woman, to eat 11% more calories from fat. And the other problem is, is salt is an appetite stimulant. And if you're trying to lose weight, I really don't recommend it. And of course, if you have high blood pressure or any kind of cardiovascular disease, I don't recommend it. You're just gonna have to do what Dr. Goldhammer says, suck it up, bite the bullet, go 30 days, the food won't taste that great. And on day 31, you won't need salt. It, you know, it really does make a difference in your cravings and your ability to lose weight and easily keep it off. Now the question was, uh -huh. are grapes um, high in sugar and are they bad for weight loss? Well, I don't think any fruit other than avocado, which is 750 calories per pound, is bad for weight loss. The thing is, is people often, if they are sugar addicts, tend to overdo fruit at the expense of the vegetables and the starch. I recommend about a pound a day, which is about two pieces of fruit. And I also recommend that you eat fruit with something else. So in other words, I like to take some pineapple, unsweetened canned or fresh and put it in my steamed kale to make my kale taste better. I like to take an envy apple and grate it in my kohlrabi and kale nightly big, big salads to make my salad taste better or even put grapes. I don't think if you are a sugar addict and overweight you should eat fruit by itself. I think you should eat it either in conjunction with your vegetables like your salad or your steamed vegetables or eat it maybe after you eat for dessert. I think for weight loss, smart veggies and starch is absolutely the way to go. I'm not telling you to deny yourself fruit, but definitely not dried fruit, by the way, because you know an, an apple is about 200 calories a pound. Apples are. Dried apples are 1,300 calories a pound, as are dates. Grapes are about 200 calories a pound. Raisins, 1,300 calories a pound. So we never want to eat dried fruit where the water has been removed. Grapes are fantastic frozen. You can pop them one at a time like sorbet. So there, is, you know, there are certain fruits that are higher in sugar, like bananas and lower in water, and a lot of people tend to overdo those, these very sweet fruits. But it, fruit, look, you, you can't gain weight from eating fruit. It's impossible. It is absolutely, and, may, and maybe from avocado and dried fruit, but you can't. So I, I don't want to say knock yourself out. As long as you're eating enough vegetables, enjoy your fruit, one, two, a couple of pieces a day, maybe more if you've hit your goal weight, but you don't gain weight from eating fruit. It's it's not possible. Let's see. Other questions are, do you eat quinoa? Yes. As a matter of fact, I'm loving quinoa now. Now, here's the thing. My husband, Charles, is allergic to quinoa, so I always kept it out of the house, but now I have a separate pressure cooker I cook it in, and ever since that arsenic rice scare, I, it's not scaring me to stop eating rice, especially since Dr. Goldhammer just spoke at our conference and convinced even Sharon McRae, the diehard, that it is okay to eat rice. But I decided to expand my repertoire of grains, 
and try to eat more quinoa and more millet, which I love. So I do, as a matter of fact, I'm having quinoa in my salad tonight. I prefer the sprouted, I prefer the red, but yes, I do eat it and often at the Whole Foods salad bar, which I love, that's one of the options. So I do eat that. I have several recipes with quinoa, the uh, quinoa tabbouleh, which we're gonna serve in Maryland this Sunday at the Eat Well, Stay Well conference, which is sold out, but you can buy the live feed online at eatwell-staywell.com. And I have the uh, quinoa salad with pistachios and currants and pomegranate seeds in my book on process. So I do like quinoa. I really like pretty much all grains, uh, except for buckwheat. I don't know why, and I take my own advice every time I go to True North, I try it. I don't think I've hit the 15 mark yet. It might be one of the few things I really don't like is buckwheat. I love millet now, though. Love it. Let's see, Nate Gershfield said, great seeing you this past uh, weekend. Thank Vegas. you, Nate. Nate the Great. Thank you. By the way, Nate, Nate is the host of Dr. Lyle's wonderful Beat Your Genes podcast that airs every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. Pacific time. It's called Beat Your Genes. It's available on iTunes and Blog Talk Radio. I believe they have over 80 episodes now. I'm a regular caller in her now that I've finally heard about this great show. So uh, th thanks, Nate. It was good to see you, too. Anything else? I got a couple more questions. Uh, let's yeah. see. Oh, um, let's see. Sharon said, "Looking forward to seeing you." Yep, Sharon McRae. McCrazies. Seeing you next this All weekend. Right. So Jennifer wants to know if I could talk a bit about maintenance mode once you hit your target weight. I noticed a couple people in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program mentioning the idea of tightening the screws once they reach a healthy weight. But I think a common reaction to reaching goal weight is to relax and feel like now it's okay to eat a bit more. What's your advice to someone once they reach the target weight? Thank you. This is a great question, Jennifer. And you know, if you have watched my story on the Dr. McDougall website or YouTube from Fat Vegan to Skinny Bitch, uh, I, I talked about this a lot because I had with the weight I am now, 117 pounds, five foot six, I had been twice in my life. I was this weight in, when, in, as a teenager, but I got that way through not eating, anore through anorexia nervosa, and I got this weight again in my 30s from taking Fen Fen. But both times it was fleeting and short-lived, and the weight came back on even faster than it went off. And so I clearly knew how to lose weight, as most people do. But where most people falter is in the weight maintenance. As a matter of fact, something like 98% of people that lose weight gain it all back within two years, about 66% in the first year and 22% in the second year. And so I think part of the problem is the mentality that people are going on a diet so therefore, if you go on a diet, eventually you're gonna go off a diet. Well, I don't look at the Ultimate Weight Loss Program as a diet, I look at it as a lifestyle. I look at it the healthiest way to eat. It's the way that Dr. Goldhammer has eaten for 40 years, even though he's never been a food addict or overweight. It's pretty close to the way Dr. Joel Furman eats and Dr. Esselstyn, I know Dr. Furman eats a little bit higher fat and Dr. Esselstyn might include flour, flour products, but they've never been overweight or food addicts. It's the way Dr. Goldhammer raised his children. So I don't look at it as a diet. It's not something I'm, I went on to go off. It's the way I eat. All diets work. The thing is, is if you don't continue to do what you did to lose weight, then you're going to put the weight back on. But here's the thing, after you lose weight, you can't eat as many calories. So to give you an example, we always talk about the RMR, the resting metabolic rate. It's about 10 calories per pound of body weight. So let's say you're a female and you weigh 200 pounds and your goal weight is, let's just say 120 pounds. And so you need to have an 80 pound weight loss to facilitate that. Well, at 200 pounds, you need, and of course, there's variances with hypothyroidism and metabolism and age and things like that. But at 200 pounds, if you're not doing anything but laying in a bed just to beat your heart and breathe your lungs, you need 2,000 calories. Well, guess what? If you're 120 pounds, now you only need 1,200 calories. That's a lot of food, 800 calories. That's two pounds of sweet potatoes. That's eight pounds of vegetables. That's four pounds of fruit. So the thing is, is now, you absolutely, in my opinion, do need to tighten the screws, and by that I mean double down. I do this when I go on trips, when I, any time that I'm in a situation, I, I actually become stricter instead of more lenient. And so what that means is you have to keep doing what you did to lose the weight, but you have to do it even more diligently. You don't have that margin of error. You know, when somebody has quite a bit of weight to lose, a little slip, even a relapse, doesn't impede their progress because they have such a higher caloric budget and they can still lose weight. But when you are at your lean weight, you don't have a lot of leeway. There's one caveat. If you exercise, exercise allows you to burn more calories at rest. It's the only way to safely 
raise your metabolism. And if you start lifting weights, which I promise I'm going to do one day because I saw all the beautiful arms of the participants in the Ultimate Weight Loss Mastery Program on the Biggest Winner panels. Laura Klum, her arms and legs, Kristen Bummer, Tammy Kramer, Shada Soleimani, BJ Swingle. I mean, when I saw the, the guns on these people, I'm going to do it one day. But the thing about lifting is you will gain weight, but you'll gain muscle weight and muscle burns more calories at rest than fat. So. Um, when you say you feel like it's okay to eat a bit more, yeah, it is okay to eat a bit more. What you're eating is vegetables, non-starchy vegetables. So um, refer to episode 36 where I show what I eat in a day. I eat more now at this weight than I did 60 pounds heavier, uh, but I eat very differently. So yeah, it, 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 I remember when um, it's been almost six years now that I've been slender after being overweight or obese for over 50 years. And I remember, I think it was about two years out, I said to Dr. Goldhammer, I said, am I okay now? He goes, what do you mean? I go, well, you know, I, I, am I safe now? Like, you know, am I gonna be okay? I, I've lost weight. He goes, the hell you are. He goes, all it's gonna take is your husband to leave you or your dog to die and you'll have your face back in that peanut butter jar faster than you can say Scooby-Doo. And you know, I re he really scared me because I had never maintained a weight loss more than like three months. And here it was two years and now it's been six years because I follow the program as designed. I don't make exceptions for birthdays or holidays or eating out or other people's houses you know people say to me oh that's so sad you don't allow yourself a treat guys when you have a calm stable brain and the slender body you've always dreamed of if you want that not everybody has to be thin or wants to be thin but once you get that that's the treat the other day we were talking at the conference and I said to dr. Doug Lyle something was happening with with something and I said well don't worry dr. Lyle I'll take care of it I'm a bulldog he goes no you're a skinny bulldog and oh my god when he said that to me, it's like whatever dopamine I used to get from eating hot fudge sundaes was like, oh my God. And I remember when I first lost weight and Dr. Esselstyn saw me for the first time and he said, hello, skinny. I mean, that's the treat, guys. That is, that is, that's so much better than the treat. So yeah, the, um, it, it is harder to maintain. That's why almost nobody does it. I mean, three fourths of Americans overweight, half of them obese. And uh, so that's why you're in the program and that we support you in doing that, you know. You might have to up your exercise. You might have to even lower the calorie density even more if you're not exercising. You might have to do certain techniques like intermittent fasting, narrowing the feeding window. Maintenance can be done, but that's where the hard work begins. Thank you, Jennifer. Here's someone who eats mm -hmm. over 50 grams of fiber each day. Good for you. Six to eight cups of water. Okay. With no meat or dairy. Good. And still has problems using the bathroom. Any ideas? Okay, so not a doctor. So always recommend that you go to a doctor because anything, whether it's a headache or GI stuff can, there's there's so many reasons for things like constipation and headaches. As a matter of fact, I remember searching the medical literature and there was something like 867 reasons for abdominal bloating. So I recommend you go to a doctor, preferably a plant-based one. You can find one at www.vegdocs.com. You can have a free consult with Dr. Alan Goldhammer if you fill out the intake form at www.healthpromoting.com and all of the wonderful medical doctors at True North like Dr. Clapper, Dr. Lim, and Dr. Sultana as well as the naturopaths like Dr. Varesh do consults and they're less than $100. Now, I get constipation because I had it my whole life, so a couple of things that are non-invasive that you can do, I recommend the Heather's Tummy Fiber. You can look at the YouTube I did with her if you want more information on it. But I find that eating more raw vegetables, you said you ate 50 grams of fiber, but you didn't say where it came from. So for constipation, raw is even better than cooked, and what seems to be even better, and I read this on Dr. Furman's website, of which I'm a member, is raw cabbage, raw raw carrots and raw beets every day in your salad. They seem to help move things along, okay? Anything? Let's see, um, yes, actually okay. Angela had said she noticed since going vegan she had hair loss and then uh, Sharon mm -hmm. uh, McRae replied that, that her daughter had a similar problem and that it was a deficiency in iodine. Nice, uh, nice for, thanks for replying. Zinc and iron. Great, well this is where a consultation with one of the doctors or even John Pierre, which you can get on my website because he's very good at these kind of things, can help. So. Oh wait, here's another one. Um, any advice on plant-based eating to balance out estrogen levels in post-menopause? You know, doctor put me in estrogen patches and testosterone cream for the compound pharmacy. Not mm. my area of expertise. You know who's really good with this is Dr. Linda Carney. She's a wizard with the women's stuff, um, and, and and of course the doctors at True North. Doctor, so 
but not my, I don't want to even venture to guess. So Dr. Linda Carney, just make sure though that it, what really helps balance all this stuff is to not be overweight and to make sure you're not imbibing any toxins like caffeine or alcohol. That, that actually helps, okay? Well, here's a question about um, the pressure cooker. Is rice cooked in the instant pot more calorie dense than no. rice cooked no. on the stove? It's always the because same. Because it needs less water. No, okay. it's always 500 calories a pound. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, Marissa says, how do I feel about mindful eating? Well, I don't know if you mean how I feel about mindful eating in general or for weight loss. I think mindfulness is a great adjunct to an otherwise healthy lifestyle, but I don't think it's the first thing that somebody necessarily should do, depending on what their goals are. You know, I took a wonderful mindfulness class at UCLA. It was called MSBR, mind, Mindfulness no, M MBSR, Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction, based on the work of John Zabit Kinn. I think it was called Full Catastrophe Living. It was taught by a nurse practitioner named Suzanne Smith. And if you go to my YouTube page, which I hope you'll subscribe to called Healthy Living, I interview her. So I'm a big fan of mindfulness. I think it's great. However, if it's just for weight loss, I don't think if you eat crap mindfully, that's gonna help. Because I think the most important thing, if you're trying to prevent or reverse a common disease of lifestyle, like heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune disease, and obesity, which is a lifestyle disease, the first thing you have to do is get the food right. And that's what we do really well in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, is we teach you to get the food right, and we have you practice that. Now, I don't think it's good to eat on the run or watching television or while on the computer or driving. I, I'm not saying that, that that's good, but I don't see any evidence to show that that's what's causing somebody to be overweight. I mean, you know, you could be distraction, could cause you to eat more. But the truth is, is, you know, if you're eating non-starchy vegetables, if you're eating zucchini at 67 calories a pound, you're not gonna gain weight from eating that. And so I took a, a, a workshop once with Janine Roth. Roth? Yeah, is it Roth or Ross? Uh, she wrote a book called Women, Food, and God. And I liked her very much. She was on Oprah. And I remember one of the things she said in her book is that if they developed a pill that, uh, that you could take so that you could eat anything you want and be lean, people would have to develop another addiction. I thought that was really cool. But in her class, we did these mindful eating exercises with a, a potato chip and a Hershey Kiss, neither of which I'm gonna eat. So it, it, I understand where she was going with this, but it, it doesn't matter if you eat slowly and mindfully if you're not eating health promoting food. So, so would you tell an alcoholic, well listen, you know, here's your problem. You're just not drinking that that fifth of vodka mindfully. So, you know, I mean, you're just not smoking that cigarette mindfully. You really want to inhale and really, you know, feel your lungs, you know? So, so again, I'm not really making fun of it because I believe in it, but I don't think it really is even necessary necessarily for weight loss, but it's not the first thing you do. Get the food right, and then if you want to do these other things, you can. Now, when I took the class at UCLA, we did the mindful eating experiment with the raisin, a food I would eat, and it was, you know, it was interesting. And again, if it works for you, please do it. But I don't see any evidence anywhere, especially in the medical literature, that it's going to help you lose weight and maintain weight. I think it's a good thing to do. But again, until you get the food right, if you're still on the sofas, meaning sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, salt, and of course animal products, I think you need to deal with that first and then do these other things. Sarah asked, when you first started and it was a struggle, how did you do it? <sighs> Charles, do you know? I mean, I, I mean, like, um, Yes, I, I, I might need to think of that question and, and re-ask it when I first, see I'm not sure when I first started what, when I first started being vegan, when I first started doing ultimate weight loss, I think I just did it. I think I just, you know, I had been exposed to Dr. Goldhammer and his teaching and he made it so uh, simple. Now, it's not, it doesn't mean it's always easy, but it just, uh, uh, Charles. Didn't, well, didn't you spend a little time up at True North? Well, yes, that always, that helped, that jump started. So you neuro adapted? Yeah, absolutely. That's, I think, for a, for a little while. I, I think without going to True North, I don't know if this would have been possible. It surely wouldn't have been as easy. Um, and, you know, I was highly motivated. I had a goal. That's the thing, you know, if you don't have your why, like I'll, I'll have clients that are trying to lose weight just for a wedding or a reunion and then they put it back on. They have no interest in changing their lifestyle. But I had a real strong why. I was allergic to anesthesia when I was a teenager and almost died and was in the hospital for a long time being resuscitated. And I am actually, I have a phobia of anesthesia. And when I broke my knee, I would do anything to not have to have that operation and I was in constant pain from the weight gain from the, the knee injury that I would do anything, even eat right. 
So I think if you're highly motivated, that helps. But like I was talking to Dr. Goldhammer today about why it's so hard for so many people to do this. He says, well, they're just not fat enough and sick enough yet. It's a good question. I'll give it more thought next week, okay? Anything else, Charles, before I go on to the last two questions? Uh, let's see. Here's someone who has a chronic um, mono for about six years. Doctors haven't been able to figure a out. chronic what? Uh, mono, I guess mononucleosis. I, I, have you heard of anyone being able to get rid of mono by eating a plant-based diet? You know, I, I, I have heard almost every miracle associated with eating a plant-based diet, and really please have a consult with one of the True North doctors. Okay, so Nadine says, Hi, Chef AJ. I know you say eat when hungry, stop when full. My problem is that when I start eating, I get more hungry than I was before. I'm currently filling at least half my plate with non-starchy vegetables. The other half is grains and legumes and I eat the non-starchy vegetables first. Do you have any idea why I feel more hungry after eating than before eating? I'm at a fairly good weight now, but I still wanna lose 10 pounds, and I'm seeing myself as a recovering food addict. Thanks in advance, love your weight loss Wednesdays, Nadine. Okay, so there's two parts of this question. I don't really know, because you're supposed to get less hungry when you eat. There is a hormone called, hormone called leptin that is, it's the satiety hormone and it's released and it tells you to stop eating. And so there are foods that actually make you more hungry when you eat them, specifically things like sugar and flour and alcohol and of course adding salt, things like that. But if you're not doing that, I don't know why eating non-starchy vegetables would make you more hungry when they're so voluminous. Now, and because you're eating starch with it. This might be a great question to ask Dr. Goldhammer if you do a consult. But I'm more concerned about the second part of your question that you're a fairly good weight, but you still want to lose 10 pounds. If you're at a fairly good weight, why do you want to lose 10 pounds? And how do you know that you need to lose 10 pounds? You know, one of the things we had on the weekend of the Ultimate Weight Loss Conference was Dr. Carrie Saunders. You can find her at drfood.org. She did something called BIA, bioimpedance analysis. And over half of the audience, which was over 200 people, had this done. And it came with a, she charged us half price. It came with this very long report that people get. And she did a lecture on what the weight means. Like when you weigh yourself on a scale, it's completely inaccurate. Even on one of those fancy scales, she does it laying down on a yoga mat with all these electrodes and she measures the stool in your colon and the intracellular and extracellular water and how much bone you have and how much fat. So, you know, not every, uh, we have to like stop this obsession with weight and be more obsessed with health. And not everyone is going to be super skinny. Not everybody can be, not everybody needs to be. I'm more concerned about how much fat you have on your body. I'm more concerned on how you feel. And I'm more concerned of your overall health. The thing is, is it's, if you really, I don't think you're in the ultimate weight loss program, maybe you are, but if you really eat the way that we suggest, which is the same diet that they promoted True North, the health promoting diet, it's the same one that Dr. McDougall talks about in his Maximum Weight Loss book, it's pretty hard to be overweight at all unless you're just egregiously you know, binging or overeating. So if the reason you feel more hungry when you eat has to do with insensitivity of your leptin, because people can vary in their ghrelin and leptin levels, one thing you can do to increase that is to go to True North and do a water fast. But one of the things you have to understand is that Dr. Goldhammer says that fasting without dietary compliance after the fast actually has limited value. And so, you know, I don't know um, why you would get more hungry when you eat. Are you waiting too long to eat? Are you waiting until you're absolutely starving? Um, I, you know, I, I think I need a little bit more information. If you're in Ultimate Weight Loss, post this on our group page. And if you're not, if you're watching now, please comment or write back. But I'm sorry that's happening to you. But again, you know, pretty much every question that's kind of more medical, have your free consult with Dr. Goldhammer or with one of the physicians at True North, and that would be a paid consult. Anything else before I get to the last question, Let's Charles? See, well, there was a question. Uh, my was, clipboard. It was, um, let's see if I can find it here. It was okay. about um, someone who's diabetic and, mm -hmm. and said that um, Dr. McDougall had allowed some sugar, and should there be, you allow sugar? I mean, that might well, be too medical. Well, 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 here's the thing, should you? You know, um, it just depends. On the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, we don't allow any sugar or any flour in any amount because these are highly addictive drugs to people that suffer from food addiction. If you're not overweight and if you're not a food addict, if you want to do what Dr. McDougall recommends and using it on the surface of the food, that's fine. The thing is, if you're a food addict, we recommend complete and permanent abstaining from sofas, sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, and salt. Based on the caloric density, sugar is 1,800 calories a pound, flour is 1,500 calories a pound. 
most overweight people I know have never been able to moderate their use of it and, and not and use it in any you know in moderate amounts the thing is, is it makes you want to eat more it's a trigger food it makes you want to eat it so if you're somebody that can put some maple syrup on your oatmeal and not be overweight and not have cravings then then do it but if you are overweight and suffering from food addiction I don't recommend any amount of sugar or flour at all or alcohol or oil or salt or animal products of course so um, you know, I don't know much about diabetes in particular. My focus is on weight loss and food addiction, and sugar does not help. It just perpetuates the disease. It's a drug. It's not a food. Sugar and flour are powders. They're not whole. They don't exist in nature. They're highly processed. They are. They raise your blood sugar more quickly. Your insulin. They're just. They're really just a nightmare for both weight and food addiction. But the reason most people can't stop is because they're highly addictive. They go through the same refining process as drugs and alcohol. Let's see, Randy's asking, do you fill your tummy often or just snack often? No, I don't, I'm not in, I don't think snacking is good. I fill my tummy two times a day and sometimes three times a day, but that's about it. And, uh, and, I don't, and if you're not hungry enough to eat vegetables, you're not hungry. I don't think snacking is good because you never get into, you know, there's those two phases, anabolic and catabolic, and the longer you can delay having food in your stomach, the better. So I don't, I'm not, I don't think frequent eating is good. It's, that's food addiction. You, 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 know, you don't need to be eating all day. You eat when you're hungry, and for most people, that's a couple of times a day, sometimes it's three times a day. You definitely don't want to be eating at night or after dinner. Okay, anything yeah. else? I'll do the last question. Yeah. Okay, so Trish says that one of her coworkers lost 75 pounds on the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, congratulations, and just got the promotion she was hoping for. So her coworker got the promotion that Trish was hoping for. Okay, and she realizes, Trish realizes that her weight is holding her back, but the idea of having to be as strict as we are in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program makes her want to eat potato chips. She tried eating vegetables for breakfast and she felt proud that she could do it, but she did not feel satisfied. She's worried that she won't be able to stay on plan long term, that it's not sustainable. When she thinks about having to give up sugar, it makes her want it even more. By the way, I have at least 100 pounds to lose. So Trish, a lot of things you said in here I hear often, like, and so let's take one of them. She goes, if, if, um, if I, if, thinking about having to give it up makes me want it more. So let me ask you a question, Trish. Not giving it up, you don't want it then. So, right, if, if, if something is true, the opposite is true. So if you don't think about having to give sugar up, so you're telling me you don't want it? See, I, I don't believe you because like an alcoholic will say the same thing, that the, the thought of having to give alcohol up makes them want it more because they're an alcoholic. When Charles had to stop drinking because of his, his heart, um, not murmur, what was it? Uh, whatever, atrial uh, flutter. It was like, okay, it didn't make him want it more because he's not an alcoholic. So if the thought of having to, if the thought of giving it up makes you want it more, that's because you're an addict. That's the reason. You know, um, I discussed this a lot with Dr. Goldhammer. I talked to him on the phone today. He says there is no evidence that restriction leads to participation. And so that's why we tell people, don't say you're never going to have it again. When you come to the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, which I don't believe you're a member of, we say just try it for 21 days. Most people can do things for 21 days, even when they're difficult. People do Lent for 40 days. They give up things like sugar and chocolate and alcohol and coffee. So we say try it for 21 days. And the thing is, is because you're addicted, when you do give it up, you will want it more because you're detoxifying and you're withdrawing. When people stop smoking cigarettes, do you think they crave cigarettes more or less? Of course, more because they're going through withdrawal. That shows you how addictive the drug is. So when you say that vegetables make you feel proud but not satisfied, we get that a lot, that vegetables do make people feel proud because when you start your day in a nutrient-dense, savory way that spice your craving, you set yourself up for success. If you didn't feel satisfied, you didn't eat enough because we don't tell you to just eat vegetables for breakfast, we tell you to eat them first. And then as soon as hunger returns, which could be in minutes to several hours later, then you eat your more satisfying, satiating starches, your sweet potatoes, your potatoes, your rice and beans. So of course vegetables are not gonna satisfy you. On their own, they're 67 to 125 calories per pound. But if you eat enough of them like I do, or if you eat starch very soon after, there's no reason why you shouldn't be satisfied. So, um, the idea, um, oh, so you're thinking that it's not going to be sustainable. I think, wait, yeah, I saw that in here, you know, she, oh yeah, she, she's felt that it's, that it's, that it's not be able to stay, this sustainable. So I say this all the time, please do whatever program you can do that is the least restrictive program to give you the results you want. 
the thing is, is when you say those programs are sustainable, to me that means you're sustaining the extra body weight, you're sustaining the food cravings, you're not eliminating them. And until you eliminate all the addictive substances, like the sofas, sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, salt, you are always gonna have cravings. The whole natural food is not gonna taste good. So is this way of eating sustainable? It is for the people that sustain it. Dr. Goldhammer sustained it for 40 years. My husband and I have sustained it for six. Shada Soleimani, who's lost over 100 pounds, has sustained it for six. All the girls on the biggest winner panel. Heather Goodwin has lost almost 300 pounds. She sustained it. So when you're an addict, nothing that doesn't include your addiction is sustainable. But when you overcome your food addiction, which is what we focus on in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, which to my knowledge is the only plant-based program that is both a health program, a weight loss program, and also a program to help you overcome food addiction and conquer cravings and lose weight without going hungry, it's not gonna be sustainable. You're right, if it, it's not gonna be sustainable. Because, so to me, that's just your addiction talking, saying you can't sustain it because you know, when, 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 if you told me that the secret to optimum health and weight loss was that I had to eliminate okra, I mean, I like okra, especially now that I have an air fryer, but you'd be like, okay. But you tell people it's sugar or oil or flour or salt or alcohol, or, or if they're not vegan, like animal products, especially cheese, they flip out, it's not gonna be sustainable. So if, you know, again, do the least restrictive program you can do to get the weight that you desire and the health that you desire, but unfortunately, for people that are addicts, a more flexible program really works. So Charles, any more questions? Uh, I yeah, don't have Monica any says, after eating a big salad and a cup of super baked potato for lunch, I'm not hungry at all until the next day. Perfect. Is there a minimum amount of food once you consume? I don't feel I'm eating enough and sometimes have to force myself. Don't ever force yourself to eat, Monica. As long as you have enough energy to do your activities of daily living, and you're not dragging around, you don't have to. Again, like I don't know if you're overweight or trying to lose weight. No, I, I mean, look, if people can fast for 40 days at True North, slender people, you can skip dinner. Perfect, it's even better because calories eaten at night are always stored in fat. The lighter the supper is, is the best and eating no supper might even be better. So it, it sounds like you're doing intermittent fasting but you're doing it earlier in the day, that's terrific. Like the Adventists say, breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. So unless you don't have enough energy to do what you need to do, never force yourself to eat or drink for that matter. This is a question, how long does the withdrawal from sugary food last? Yeah, so it depends on what your dose was before. So, you know, I told this story before that when I went to the Optimum Health Institute on July 6, 2003, it was a Sunday, I got picked up at the San Diego airport and I had the cab driver take me to 7-Eleven. I had a Coke Slurpee in one hand and a Dr. Pepper in the other, regular Dr. Pepper. And I was there for eight days and probably the first six, I was pretty sick. I had nausea, I had diarrhea, I had bloating, I had headaches, I had irritability and mood swings. So that was the worst of it, it was about six days. But remember, I had 43 years of severe overuse of sugar. So that, again, depends on how long, uh, how bad the detox is. It depends on what, uh, you know, how, how long you've used and what dose. And then the other time that I detoxed was when I kind of got back into it. I wasn't eating white sugar or white flour, but I was having like, you know, a little agave and things like that because I thought it was good. It took about three weeks. Not to, I didn't get the physical. The second time that I detoxed off sugar because I wasn't eating that much and I wasn't eating white sugar, but this is when I really stopped eating all sugar, oil, and salt. It was August 1st, 2008. I didn't have the physical symptoms like I had the first time, but I cried every day for about three weeks because I realized then that I was an addict and that I have to give this up if I wanted to be sane. And I, so, so the emotional actually took longer than the physical. The physical detox for some people can take as little as three or four days. Again, it just depends what your diet was like before and what your diet is now. And so what I might suggest to people that are severe addicts is instead of just giving up sugar, start having more health promoting food while you're still using sugar. So still do all the sugar you're doing, but start eating more fruits and vegetables. Maybe do, I don't recommend smoothies for weight loss, but however you can get those greens in by any greens necessary, try to build up some of your nutrient reserves by eating health promoting food and sweet potatoes and things like that. And then it might be easier to come off sugar. That's why a water fast at True North can be so great because your detox period, while it may be severe, will be shorter. Let's see, uh, Kathy says, True North is too far from me. Any programs like it in Texas? 
Texas um, well, not to my knowledge. I mean, there is the Optimum Health Institute in Austin, Texas that I've been to that's wonderful. It's not exactly the same as True North. There won't be any medical care there. Uh, True North is really the best we've got. There is now a fasting center in Florida, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and one in Ohio, Dr. Gracie Yoon. But, you know, it's too far, but if it's gonna save your life, then distance and money are no object. Let's see. Um... Tracy asks, uh, what about other starches like oat bran? Um, I think oat isn't oat, but oat bran is separated from the oat. See, I don't recommend anything processed. The oat bran is the bran. I recommend the whole oat groat. The more a food is processed, the worse it is for weight loss. The less a food is processed, the better it is for weight loss. See, Kathy wants to know, how can I use a whole food plant-based diet to get more energy? Well, I think you have to eat enough calories, you know? I mean, I, I mean, I think you need to go to the doctor to see why you don't have energy, first of all. And Cindy says, I try to have my feeding window 12 to 6 p.m. Yeah, that's a think? great one. That is a perfect one. That's, that's about mine. Sometimes mine's 11 to 7, but that's a very good, that's a good window for intermittent fasting. It's because you get lunch and dinner. What Linda do asks, uh, how do you deal with friends and family who tease you for eating different than them? We're going out to eat. Um, Charles, do we have the little red thing? That I, I don't know if we if you can find it while I'm talking. While Charles is looking for the answer to that question, it may be, uh, well, hopefully we'll find it. I just want to thank everybody in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program for coming to the conference, for supporting it both in person and watching the live feed, which you can still get on our website, and for all the great gifts you gave me. I hope I remember who gave me what so I can thank you. So how do you deal with it? So this is one of, in my new talk, Chef AJ's 10 commandments for overcoming your weight loss obstacles. One of them is not engaging with enablers. And so how you deal with these people is gonna depend on your personality. So if you are a highly agreeable person, it's gonna be a lot harder for you, and especially if you have lower self-esteem to stand up to these people. And so I recommend a video by Dr. Doug Lyle on his website, esteemdynamics.org, called Getting Along, Going Along, where he gives some pretty good strategies for kind, nice, agreeable people. See, for me, I just don't take crap from anybody. And I was looking for this little pen I have that, that it, it's, you push it and it says no in all these different loud voices. Uh, this is one of the reasons it's so helpful to be in a supportive group like the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, because, especially in the mastery, because we work on these things. We develop strategies and, and like actual scripts for you to say, but it's very difficult because I think where most people fail, I hate the word fail, but where most people slip up and relapse, fall off the wagon, if you will, is in the area of social support. Because the truth is, is very few people dislike the food. I mean, I serve my food to regular people all the time. I work in a non-vegan restaurant. People love my food. People love my food now. I know how to cook SOS free. And, it's, and he, there are a few people that really have a horrible diet that take longer to neuroadapt, but eventually people love the food. It's not hard to make, it's not expensive. But where I see most people have problems, and I asked a few people actually this weekend, I said, what is your biggest problem? And it always was, well, I can't go out and eat, because you can't. You really cannot get a compliant meal at a restaurant. You're fooling yourself if you think you can. You certainly can't get one at anybody else's house. Except for those 200 people or so that were at the Live Ultimate Weight Loss Conference, nobody else eats like us. So you're absolutely right. So the bigger question is how do you deal with people that are rude to you and teasing you? How would you do that if it wasn't about the food? Let's say they were just teasing you because you had a bad haircut or they didn't like your outfit. I mean, don't take crap from people. One of the things that I really strive to teach people in the program, especially with John Pierre, especially around the holidays when we have the Women's Empowerment Boot Camp, is to empower people, especially women. Nobody has the right to criticize you or denigrate you for your diet or any other reason. And if you're taking crap, then you gotta find a way not to. Maybe a session with John Pierre or Doug Lyle, but do what I do, just say no, you know? And once you have the body you've always dreamed of, you become an expert and they kind of leave you alone. Well, they, they, then they tell you you're too thin and all, all kinds of other things. So, you know, it is hard. The social aspect is the hardest part. That's why we have Ultimate Weight Loss. We have a tribe, and I hope you'll consider joining. Charles, anything else or we can end? Uh, let's it's... see. Oh, we had a question, and they're kind of flying by. Someone that said, what do you do if you're, if you're having trouble neuroadapting to the yeah. food? Right, okay. And by the way, I do take the time to always go through this and try to answer all your questions after the broadcast and either answer them directly on the page or save them for next week. So if you're having trouble neuroadapting, this is where going to True North is so useful. This is where a water fast helps you neuroadapt sooner, 
course, you're going to have to clean up your environment. You're going to have to stop adding chemicals to your food like sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, salt. It does happen. It takes about 30 days for salt, 90 to 121 days for fat. You never neuroadapt, meaning you never not like sugar, but you can learn to satisfy your sweet tooth with the fruit, the whole fruit, but nothing but the fruit. So help me God. You can eat more simply. You can do mono eating and just eat potatoes. I don't mean for a year, but just like potatoes for one meal, sweet potatoes for another, or keep it very simple like sweet potatoes and broccoli. That's what I do. The fewer the choices, but it does take time, guys. It does take time. You know, I wish I could make it go faster. I wish I could make a wet magic wand, but you know, how bad do you want it? You have to take the time. You have to have some discomfort if you eventually want to be a skinny bitch and have stellar health. Anything else? Or we'll just I say I think we're out of time. All right. So hopefully I'll see you in Maryland this Sunday. If not, watch the live feed. You can get it at eatwell-staywell. Come to see me in Rancho La Puerta. After that, I have San Francisco Veg Fest on October 1st. I believe I'm speaking at the Garden Room at 1 o'clock. And if you live in Los Angeles, please consider taking my home class. It's Sunday, September 17th. We do 10 recipes. We have entertainment. It's a wonderful, very affordable class. And in October, we're going to have a live Ultimate Weight Loss Program in Los Angeles, California. So thank you guys so much for coming to the conference, supporting me and my work. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure getting to know you. Really, a pr 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 I can't speak. I'm so tired still, so I don't have any makeup on today. I know you guys always write I look better without makeup, so here you are. No makeup. It was a pr pleasure, a privilege, and an honor meeting you and your family. And I just want to give a special shout out to Paul and Neil, who touched everyone's heart. There wasn't a dry eye in the house when everyone was saying how hard it is. Well, this is a gal who works in the military in Afghanistan, and if she can do it, you can do it. So Paul and Neil, you're my hero. And thanks all you guys for watching another episode of Weight Loss Wednesday, episode 44. Send in those questions to eatunprocessed.com and please consider subscribing to my mailing list and my YouTube page. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Chef AJ. And now more than ever, after seeing the hundreds of people at the conference doing this, I really do believe that you can have both the health and the body you so richly deserve. Thanks for watching and thank you, Charles, for filling in for Kenny and Eden. Good night, everyone.